The professor and sociologist Maury Schwartz used to tell a joke to begin all of his classes, and it goes like this. There's this wave bobbing along in the ocean, having a grand old time. He's enjoying the wind and the fresh air until he notices the other waves in front of him crashing against the shore. My God, this is terrible, the wave says. Look what's going to happen to me. Then along comes another wave. It sees the first wave looking grim, and it says to him, why do you look so sad? And the first wave says, you don't understand, we're all going to crash. All of us waves are going to be nothing. Isn't that terrible? And the second wave says, no, you don't understand. You're not a wave. You're part of the ocean. Now, I tell you that joke because when it comes to death, most atheists think we don't have a competitive answer to religion. But I would argue that, in fact, we do. But like all other answers atheism has for its religious equivalents, it requires a shift in viewpoint. Take, for example, community. Right? I know that might seem like a strange thing to bring up in defense of religion, but in reality, it's one of its only real benefits, right? Gathering once a week or more with people to, you know, laugh and eat and sing songs and talk about big ideas has all kinds of benefits. And for years, religious apologists used that to defend the idea that, you know, even if religion isn't true, it's useful. But of course, as gathering became easier and easier to do in secular settings, we realized that you can laugh and eat and talk about big ideas and sing songs without invisible commandments from God. And in fact, it's recommendable. Me and a group of magicians, we meet up every single week at the same bar in Midtown Manhattan, and we have been for 11 years. The difference is nobody asks for 10% of our income, and nobody gets kicked out for being gay. In fact, one of our youngest members, a 17-year-old girl, came out to us as gay this year before she came out to her parents because she knew she could take to a corner booth with one of the older queer members of the group to talk about her worries and fears. She knew she could show us pictures of her new girlfriend without sideways glances. She knew she was safe and accepted there because religion doesn't own community. They just also happen to do it. And this is true of literally all the defenses of religion, right? If you look at their so-called benefits from a different angle, the secular equivalent is obviously superior, right? We've got charities that do in fact have to tell you what they're doing with their money and aren't allowed to hold it back from whoever the fuck their God told them they hate 2,000 years ago. If you're into hallucinations and ecstasy, can I recommend good old-fashioned drugs, which ask nothing of you but to drink enough water? Over and over again, the secular equivalent is so obviously superior to the religious version, it's laughable. Except when it comes to the afterlife, right? Because even well-meaning, well-educated atheists will admit we don't have a better version of an afterlife to offer because, after all, how can you offer a real equivalent to a lie? But again, with a shift in perspective, I would argue that not only can we offer a better afterlife, but we must. So first things first out of the way, they're not offering something real either. And it's easy to forget that because of how culture views promises of the afterlife, but, but it does actually matter. If I promise you a hundred bucks I'm never going to give you and Steve promises you nothing, we are both still very much giving you nothing. The happiness and the ease and the comfort and the relief that you might feel about my promise is not a good thing and it certainly doesn't make my lie defensible. And even if it were real, the slightest bit of thought about these so-called afterlives reveals them to be absurd at best and near instantly hellacious at worst. I mean, nobody wants to do anything forever. I mean, oh, you like candy and orgasms? How about candy and orgasms forever, for infinity, for 10,000 thousand lifetimes? Doesn't that sound fun? No, it sounds insane. It sounds like being cursed by a genie. And it certainly doesn't sound like paradise. No, what the afterlife offers people, what everyone is really on board with, from Ray Comfort to Ray Lean down at the Piggly Wiggly, is the continuation of consciousness. We end up talking to a lot of new atheists, and by that I mean new to atheism, not necessarily young, and what a lot of people can't get over is this idea that the themness of them is just going to stop. But as I point out to them, you lose consciousness every night when you go to bed right? 
You don't wake up screaming, my God, my God, my consciousness, how I miss the ability to think about what I want for breakfast. No, you were asleep. We don't sit around weeping for the lost memory of what we had for lunch last Tuesday, and yet the loss of our memories at death keeps us up at night. I mean, I know it's kept me up at night. But what if, like charity, community, and bliss, a shift in perspective eases that worry? What if what matters is not our thinking being in the here and now, but the fact that we thought and were at all? Because small as it sounds, I've got good news for you. You exist. No matter how good or bad a person you might imagine yourself to be, no matter if you die tomorrow or in a hundred years, it is undeniable that you made up a part of this world and you always will have. The things you do, be they small or tremendous, will have been done. And nothing as inconsequential as death is ever going to change that or make it matter less. That's true of everyone who has ever lived and it will be true of everyone who ever lives. That's the meaning of life so far as any life has ever had meaning. Religion will promise you a wave that goes on and on forever and ever. And that's a lie that, honestly, you wouldn't want to be true, even if it could be. But I've got good news. You're part of the ocean. <laughs>